royals who died from the bubonic plague. The year is 1335. Mongol Sultan Abu Sayyid Badur Khan leads his army across the mountains of modern-day Azerbaijan on his way to put down yet another rebellion. Last night, the Sultan went to bed with a splitting headache. In the morning, his doctors are horrified to see that their 30-year-old ruler is burning with fever and covered in tender, pus-filled swellings. The royal physicians have no idea how to relieve his suffering. He dies in agony on the night of December 1st, 1335, leaving the Sultanate in crisis without an heir. The horrified viziers spring into action, finding someone to blame. In their minds, the mysterious symptoms reek of poison. The most likely suspect is Abu Sayyid's ex-wife, Princess Baghdad Khatun. When the Sultan fell in lust with her, he had her brother and father strangled and forced her to divorce the husband she loved. When she was shockingly displeased to be added to his harem, Abu Sayyid divorced her and married her niece instead. The princess was understandably miffed, so the viziers assumed she must have plotted to murder the Sultan. They sent guards to find the princess, and she was discovered taking a bath. Baghdad was beaten to death for her crimes. Before long, others in the Mongol camp fell ill with the same awful symptoms of swollen lymph nodes and blackened fingers. It was too late for the princess when it became clear that Sultan Abu Sayyid had not been poisoned, but was in fact the first royal victim of a terrible new pandemic, the Black death. He would not be the last. As the great pestilence burned across Central Asia, North Africa, and Europe, roughly 100 million people lost their lives in the worst pandemic in human history. More than half of the populations of Florence, Paris, and London fell victim. We will never know the names of most of the poor souls who met their end in mass graves. But perhaps the best way to put a human face on this apocalyptic event is to explore the lives of those victims for whom we do have carefully kept records, the royals. Today, let's meet 21 kings, queens, and princes who were cut out of history by the scythe of the Black Death and the many outbreaks of plague that followed. And we'll see how their sudden deaths change the course of history. British Royals Joan of England was born in 1333 to King Edward III. She spent her early years traveling with her parents as they fought the Hundred Years' War with France. At 14, she kissed her parents goodbye and boarded a ship bound for Castile, where she was set to marry Pedro, the heir to the throne. The princess bride was dressed in the finest velvet and silk, bedecked with dazzling jewels, and it took an entire ship to carry her trousseau. She traveled through hostile France with an intimidating retinue of armed guards, but they could not keep the princess safe from a danger no knight could vanquish. The party stopped to rest at a castle the Plantagenet family owned in Bordeaux. The pestilence had already crept north from Italy and Spain, but it was unknown in England so Joan's protectors had no idea of the danger. They heard of an outbreak of illness in the city, but made no moves to leave their comfortable chateau. Before long, members of the entourage fell ill. The Lord Chancellor died on August 20th. In desperation, they moved the princess to the small village of Lormio, but it was too late. She succumbed to the disease on September 2nd, 1348. Most royals who died on the road were embalmed and carried home with great honor. But in the chaos of the pandemic, Joan was buried quickly in Bayonne Cathedral. A statue of her was erected in Westminster Abbey and later placed next to her father's tomb. King Edward wrote a sorrowful letter to his daughter's intended father-in-law, Alfonso XI of Castile, informing him of her sad demise and writing that she had been sent ahead to heaven to reign among the choirs of virgins. Blanche was the only child of the Duke of Lancaster and inherited everything. 
She was also exceedingly beautiful and noted for her elegant white neck. At 17, she wed her cousin, John of Gaunt, the fourth son of King Edward III. Though the title Duke of Lancaster had become extinct upon her father's death, it was recreated for her husband and has been held by the English monarch ever since. The couple had a happy marriage and seven children. In 1368, John kissed Blanche goodbye and rode off to France to fight in his father's war. In September, he received word that his beloved had died of the plague at the age of 26. Heartbroken, he returned to England and threw her a massive funeral at St. Paul's Cathedral. John held annual memorials for her for the rest of his life. At one such event, a young poet named Geoffrey Chaucer read The Book of the Duchess. It tells of a sorrowful knight wandering a moonlit wood in search of his lost love. The poem was meant to encourage the prince to get over his grief and hurry up and marry his mistress, Catherine Swinford, who happened to be Chaucer's sister-in-law. John did remarry, but he commissioned a grand double tomb, which he eventually shared with his beloved Blanche. Edward of Angoulême was born in France while his famous warrior father, Edward the Black Prince, fought in the Hundred Years' War. Little Edward was second in line to the throne, and in the popular imagination, he was seen as the next step in the glorious line of valiant English kings. The royal children were in Bordeaux in the autumn of 1370, when an epidemic of plague struck. Five-year-old Edward's strong young body fought the disease as long as it could but this only prolonged his suffering. He died on September 29th. When the Black Prince returned from the siege of Limoges and learned of his son's death, he was a broken man. He had contracted dysentery and he languished in his sickbed for five years, then died at the age of 45, predeceasing his father and leaving his nine-year-old second son, Richard, as heir to the throne. Things didn't work out well for him, which we'll soon learn. It is quite possible that if the icy hand of plague hadn't snatched young Edward of Angoulême out of history, the Wars of the Roses and the rise of the Tudors never would have happened. Anne of Bohemia was the daughter of Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV. While most royal brides brought rich dowries with them, Richard II had to pay for the honor of marrying Anne. They were both 15 and forged a loving bond, which was probably not sexual as he was attracted to men. The couple never had any children. English peasants, angry about the socioeconomic problems that followed the Black Death, revolted against the crown. Richard violently suppressed the rebellion. Anne publicly pled for mercy, but the king had many rebels brutally executed. Richard next made the nobles despise him by pulling out of the Hundred Years' War that was keeping them rich. His enemies attempted a coup, but Anne's wisdom and popularity helped him keep control of the country. Together they ruled over a sophisticated court of art, music, and literature. But in June 1394, after 13 years of marriage, Queen Anne fell ill and was confined to her rooms at Sheen Palace. She died of the plague at 28. Richard was so devastated that he ordered the wing of the palace in which she had died raised to the ground. Anne was buried in an elaborate ceremony at Westminster Abbey in a double tomb with gold effigies of she and Richard holding hands. The king married Isabella of Valois, but his seven-year-old bride could not replace the political partner he had lost in Anne. Richard was captured by his cousin, Henry, the son of John of Gaunt. The king was forced to abdicate, imprisoned, and murdered at 32. He was laid next to Anne much sooner than anyone expected. During the reign of his usurper, Henry IV, a Welsh noble named Owain Glendower rose up against the English, who had ruled his country since 1301. The Welsh crowned Owain Prince of Wales. He fought for 10 years but could not compete with the English army. Owain disappeared in 1412, and it is not known what became of him. However, we do know that his son, Griffith Op Owain, was captured and locked in the Tower of London. He languished there for seven years and died of the plague at 37. 
a sad end for the man who would have been Prince of Wales had his father's rebellion succeeded. Instead, the title was held by the English heir to the throne, who became Henry V in 1413. But the hero of Agincourt died of dysentery at 36, leaving the crown on the tiny head of his 10-month-old son, Henry VI. He did not inherit his father's military genius and lost nearly all of England's territory in France. He suffered serious mental illness. His cousin, Richard of York, became regent, but he wanted the crown. War broke out between the cousins. Henry's family, the Lancasters, who took their name from Blanche, and Richard's family, the Yorks. Each used a rose as their emblem. Thus, the Wars of the Roses began. After Richard of York was killed in battle, his eldest son, handsome and charismatic Edward IV, seized the throne. He and his wife, Elizabeth Woodville, had ten children, seven daughters and three sons. Their youngest, George, Duke of Bedford, was born at Windsor Castle. He was just two when an outbreak of the plague struck the area in 1479. Little George was buried in St. George's Chapel. Just four years later, his father joined him after a sudden illness at 40. He left his 12-year-old eldest son, Edward V, vulnerable on the throne. His uncle Richard placed the king and middle brother Richard in the Tower of London. While putting off their coronation, he uncovered a priest who swore that his nephews were illegitimate. And who was next in line for the crown? Why, Richard, of course. The princes in the tower were never seen again. Had their baby brother George survived the plague, there might have been three princes lost in the tower. Or perhaps their mother would have been able to keep one of her three sons out of their uncle's clutches, thus preserving the Plantagenet dynasty. Usurper Richard III was deeply unpopular with both sides of the family, but a new branch had emerged to challenge him. Edmund Tudor, Earl of Richmond, was born to Henry V's widow, Catherine of Valois, through her secret marriage to her Welsh butler, Sir Owen Tudor. Though his birth was less than auspicious, Edmund and his brother Jasper were close advisors to their half-brother, King Henry VI. He granted them wealth and earldoms. The king even considered naming Edmund his heir, but he was vetoed for having no English royal blood. 25-year-old Edmund remedied this by marrying 12-year-old Margaret Beaufort, the great-granddaughter of John of Gaunt. She had a strong claim to the throne. Edmund refused to follow custom by waiting until his child bride was in her late teens to consummate their marriage. He impregnated her, then marched off to Wales to subdue a rebellion. Edmund was captured in battle and imprisoned in a dungeon crawling with rats and fleas. He died of the plague in 1456 at the age of 26. Two months later, 13-year-old Margaret gave birth to a son. The labor devastated her underdeveloped body and she was not able to have more children. She put all her will behind making her only child, Henry, king. He grew up to defeat King Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth and claim the throne in 1485. He married Edward IV's daughter, Elizabeth of York, and together they ended the Wars of the Roses by reuniting the Lancasters and Yorks and launching the new Tudor dynasty. But one has to wonder how history might have been different if so many key players of the 14th and 15th century hadn't been blotted out by the plague. French Royals Joan II, Queen of Navarre her mother, Margaret of Burgundy, along with her two sisters-in-law, were accused of adultery in the Tour de Nesle scandal. The princesses were imprisoned and their alleged lovers executed. As Margaret's husband, the future Louis X, had no other legitimate children, he claimed Joan as his own, whether or not she actually was. But still, she was a girl, so she could not inherit the French throne. She was allowed to rule the small kingdom of Navarre and was crowned there in 1329 at the age of 17. Her husband ruled with her as King Philip III and they had six children. 
In 1349, an outbreak of plague devastated France and took out three royal ladies, including the 37-year-old Queen of Navarre. She was laid to rest in the Basilica of Saint-Denis next to her father. Jeanne of Burgundy, Queen of France, was the daughter of the Duke of Burgundy. She was born with a club foot and scoliosis. She was wed to Philippe, Count of Valois, the cousin of the king. Jeanne loved to read and translate manuscripts. She ensured that her nine children received exemplary educations, even the girls. The family lived happily for 15 years, but in 1328, King Charles IV died without an heir, and Jeanne's husband became King Philippe IV. Edward III of England claimed the French throne through his mother, Isabella, but the French did not accept royal lines that passed through female heirs. Edward and Philippe's argument became known as the Hundred Years' War. While Philippe was off defending his throne, Jeanne was an excellent regent. She promoted education and set up the French as a center of thought and culture in the coming centuries. Still, the nobility distrusted her and called her the lame, evil queen. Jeanne held strong in the face of her enemies, but there was one foe she could not defeat. After 21 years in power, she died of the plague at 56. Bonne of Luxembourg was the daughter of Count Jean of Bohemia. At 17, she wed the 13-year-old French heir, Jean, Duke of Normandy. Her birth name, Jutta, means good, but was changed to the French, Bon. Over 17 years, the Duchess delivered seven children. She died in the same 1349 pandemic as her mother-in-law. She was 34 and never got the chance to be queen. Her husband fled Paris to save himself. Within a month of his wife's death, he remarried. Iberian Royals Eleanor of Portugal, Queen of Aragon, was the youngest daughter of King Alfonso IV of Portugal. When she was 18, the kings of Castile and Aragon fought over her hand, as they both wanted an alliance with her father. Aragon won, and Eleanor was wed to King Pedro IV in Barcelona, but the union lasted just one year before she was killed by the plague in 1348 at the age of 20. Alfonso XI, King of Castile, was only one year old when his father, Fernando IV, died. His mother, Constance of Portugal, became regent, but she died when he was two. His uncle took the regency, but died when he was eight. Then his grandmother took charge. She lasted until Alfonso was ten. During this instability, Castile was overrun by rebellious nobles and invading Moors. With no relatives left to govern, the young king took power at 14. He wed seven-year-old Costanza Manuel, but he annulled their marriage after two years as he was eager to have a wife of his own age. He wed his double first cousin, Maria of Portugal. She delivered one son, Pedro. It was his bride-to-be, Joan of England, who died of the plague on the way to their wedding. Alfonso neglected his queen and flaunted his mistress, Eleanor, with whom he had ten children. The king ruled ruthlessly, earning the nickname the Cruel. In the spring of 1350, the 38-year-old king marched his army to lay siege to Gibraltar. He planned to take the strategic rock from the Muslim emirate of Granada. But while the Castilian army was waiting outside the city walls for its inhabitants to surrender or starve, the specter of death came upon them. From the lowest foot soldier to the highest general, they dropped like flies. King Alfonso died on the night of March 25, 1350. The Sultan of Granada ordered his men not to attack the Castilian army while they retreated, carrying their king's coffin. Philippa of Lancaster, Queen of Portugal, was the eldest daughter of John of Gaunt and Blanche of Lancaster. She was 27 when she was married to King João I of Portugal to seal an Anglo-Portuguese alliance which lasted until the Napoleonic Wars. When she arrived in Lisbon, she banished her husband's mistress to a convent, but allowed his many illegitimate children to stay at court. Philippa delivered nine children of her own. She was influential in both Portuguese and English politics and helped her brother, Henry IV, usurp the English throne. At 55, the queen fell ill with plague. 
She called her three sons to her bedside to bid them farewell, and gave them each a jewel-encrusted sword and a supposed piece of the true cross. In her final hours, Philippa was lucid and without pain, unusual for a plague patient. She prayed with her priest, then died peacefully with a smile on her face. Fortunately, her deathbed farewell did not transmit the plague to any of her sons. The eldest, Duarte, became king of Portugal in 1433 at the age of 42. He encouraged his brother, Henry the Navigator, to explore the west coast of Africa. Following a disastrous attempt to conquer Tangier, Duarte fell victim to the plague in 1438. He died at 46, after just five years on the throne. Italian Royals Ludovico became king of Sicily at the age of four. His mother tried to calm tensions between noble families, but civil war broke out. She died when her son was 11. His next guardian was murdered. Ludovico asked Pedro IV of Aragon for help and was able to subdue the rebellious nobles. While on the march, the 17-year-old king's army stopped in Catania. The city was hit by a plague epidemic and the king fled to a remote seaside castle. But it was too late. Ludovico was already infected. He died in 1355, leaving the throne to his brother, Federico. Luigi I was the son of Catherine II, Latin Empress of Constantinople. He and his older brother, Roberto, were both sleeping with their cousin, Queen Giovanna I of Naples. She was unhappy with her husband, Andrew, who was pressuring her to make him co-monarch. Luigi, Roberto, and Giovanna plotted together to murder Andrew. Once he was out of the way, the queen had her pick of the two brothers. Just then, their mother died and Roberto left for Constantinople to claim his birthright. Giovanna was left with Luigi, whom she reluctantly married. As the man, Luigi was in command of the army, while Giovanna dealt with the more feminine issues like having babies and the economy. In vengeance, Andrew's brother, King Louis I of Hungary, invaded Naples. The Black Death struck the Hungarian army, and King Louis was forced to retreat. Luigi used this technical victory to usurp more of his wife's power and force her to crown him king. He purged the court of her supporters and had her favorite and possible lover, Enrique, executed. After Ludovico of Sicily died of the plague, Luigi tried to dethrone his younger brother, Federico, but he failed. Luigi himself caught the plague and died in 1362 at the age of 42. Queen Giovanna finally had her power back. She married twice more, but made sure that her next husbands stayed in their place. Frederico the Simple died at 35, leaving Sicily to his 13-year-old daughter, Maria I. She was controlled by the leaders of four noble families. To prevent her marrying a king who would take her power, one of the nobles kidnapped the queen and imprisoned her for two years. She was rescued by two other nobles and taken to Aragon, where she was wed to her cousin, Martin. He became her co-monarch. While the royal family was watching a jousting tournament, their two-year-old son, Peter, was hit in the head by an errant lance and killed. Maria fell into depression. A few months later, when a surge of plague swept through Sicily, the weakened queen was an easy target. She died in 1401, age 37. In 1349, a ghost ship washed up on the shore of Denmark. Locals found only corpses, swollen with black faces. They stayed long enough to carry off valuable cargo and plenty of fleas. The plague had arrived in Scandinavia. Scandinavian Royals Erik Magnusson was the son of Magnus IV, King of Sweden and Norway. He favored his second son, Håkon, and gave Norway to him, but told Erik that he would get Sweden after his old man died. Erik didn't want to wait and rebelled against his father. The family tension ended suddenly when Erik died of the plague in 1359 at the age of 20. His wife, Beatrix of Bavaria, daughter of Holy Roman Emperor Louis IV, was pregnant. 
If she delivered a son, he would be the next king of Sweden. But Beatrix also contracted the plague. She delivered a stillborn boy, then succumbed to the disease on Christmas Day, 1359. She was only 15 years old. The young family were buried together in Blackfriars Monastery in Stockholm. Håkon VI lost control of Sweden to the Germans. His father arranged for him to marry 10-year-old Danish princess Margrethe. Thus, all three of the Nordic kingdoms would be united under their heir. At 17, Margrethe delivered a son, Olaf. Following the deaths of his father and grandfather, he became king of Norway and Denmark at the age of 10. Margrethe was a competent, wise, and well-respected regent. King Olaf died suddenly at the age of 16, and his mother became the first queen regnant in Scandinavia. She reconquered Sweden in 1398 and united the three Scandinavian kingdoms, plus the Faroe Islands, Iceland, and Greenland, into the Kalmar Union. Together, they were able to compete with the German Hanseatic League. With Margrethe's guidance, the nations grew in wealth and power. She was energetic even into her old age and traveled extensively throughout her realm. In 1412, the 59-year-old queen was aboard her ship when a pesky flea found its way into her royal cabin. In a matter of days, Scandinavia was robbed of its greatest queen. Margrethe was buried in Ruskile Cathedral, where a bell is still rung twice a day in her honor. Want even more tea on history? Check out the History Tea Time podcast. You can now follow History Tea Time on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other history videos. You can also join my Patreon to support my work and get early access to all of my multi-part series. Thank you for watching.